Well, welcome everybody. This is a, a new item for us today. Today we're pioneering kind of a little question and answer session. So you get to spend a little quality time here with me. Um, what we've done is we've solicited your questions in advance and have asked you to send those in. Uh, and I've gone through those and I'm Dr. Daniel Neely. I'm a professor of pediatric ophthalmology at Indiana University. I've also been a Orbis volunteer faculty for about 15 years and I help with the CyberSight telemedicine program. So uh, uh, that's my background. I practice pediatric ophthalmology full time and I've been um, to at least 20 countries uh, around the world um, working with, with many of you. Um, so we have these questions that have been submitted in advance, <clears throat> and I'll start by going through those. And we'll, some of the, um, we'll also be taking questions online through the chat system. So uh, I'll monitor that. If, if there's something that I can touch on while we're doing this and that might fit in with some of the other questions, I'll, I'll answer it uh, live. Um, if we have time at the end, I'll go to the chat questions also. If we just have too much to get through and we don't get to the chat questions, um, we'll save those and I will, uh, we'll do another one of these and we'll start off uh, with those, excuse me. <clears throat> so um, what we'll do is uh, I've gone through and I've tried to include as many diverse countries uh, around the world as I could. And I also tried to consolidate, some of the questions were similar, so sometimes you'll see there um, several questions uh, on the same topic. And uh, let's just dig right in. I'll also be using a whiteboard today. <coughs> um, we'll start off by going to a, uh, a uh, PowerPoint um, just so you can see the questions. So I'm gonna share my screen and let's get into my, uh, my PowerPoint. And here we go. All right, so you should be able to see my, uh, my PowerPoint. And this is our very first question. Uh, this one comes from uh, South Africa. And the question was, what's the best time for cataract surgery? Well, uh, it's a bit of an open-ended question. Um, but let's say we're mostly talking about infants here. And the optimal time for cataract surgery is as soon as possible. Because um, you, you need to have these kids seeing as quickly as possible um, before nystagmus develops. Um, nystagmus, once nystagmus develops in the eyes, which is around a couple months of age, um, it's really hard to get good visual acuity results, of course. <clears throat> so as soon as possible, um, but also when it can be done safely. You know, a lot of the places we work in um, around the world, pediatric anesthesia is very um, difficult. And um, so you always have to take that into consideration uh, when, you're, when, you're, uh, uh, when you're working with these infants. You need to um, be sure that you can get the kids asleep safely. Um, you may need to consider doing both eyes at the same time. And um, for me, the optimum timing for this is uh, if it's a bilateral cataract, you have a little more time, so somewhere in the ballpark of four to eight weeks after birth. And if they have a unilateral cataract, trying to get this done by four to six weeks after birth. And of course, uh, there's always um, some factors there with prematurity. One thing to remember here, though, is we're not just talking about having the surgery done by this time. We, we, need, to, we need to be talking about... Um, uh, we need to be talking about being able to have the eyes optically corrected, all right? So they need to have an intraocular lens. They need to have glasses. They need to have a contact lens. Something like that um, has to be going on in order to, um, in order to um, have this eye rehabilitated. Uh, I'm going to put in a little plug right now. Um, many of you have maybe seen uh, some of these older Orbis manual. So here's the uh, one that I helped write um, with uh, Ed Wilson and, and others. And this is the pediatric cataracts in childhood. And the nice thing about this at the time, um, it's just black and white, but of course you can see that it's step by step on how to do a uh, vitrector or IA cataract in an infant. And it has things in here like uh, intraocular lens calculation, 
um, targets for infants and um, and so forth, parts plane and measurements. Well, in the last year, we've completely redone that system. And now if you go to, um, if you go to uh, the cyber site, let me go back to my share here. If you go back to the uh, uh, cyber site library, what you'll find is that these pediatric cataract books that we used to print are now interactive modules. <coughs> so this, this happens, the pediatric cataract module happens to be a three-part mod module. One is evaluation and management. Two, there's the step-by-step -step surgery, which we had in the printed manual. And then there are, uh, there's a third section which has to do with technical aspects. And um, this is part of a larger series that you should be aware of, which is a full course on pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus, since that's mostly what we're talking about today. Um, uh, this goes stepwise through evaluating the strabismus patient, basic strabismus number two. Module three, the one we're talking about right now, is pediatric cataract. Module four is advanced strabismus, so superior oblique, vertical muscles, inferior oblique. Uh, and then module five is pediatric glaucoma, and module six is retinoblastoma. So pretty much these six modules are the things that I see to be in highest demand when I go out on programs. And I think that um, what you should do is take a look at these. You have to register for these, uh, but they're free. And they're, they're really nice. These are slick. They're interactive. They have pop-ups on them. They have videos built into them. Uh, there are quizzes you can take. And then there are supplemental materials. If you want to download a PDF of this old, uh, old manual, you can still do that. And uh, it has, it's not just from me. It's from many authors. And I think you can find that that's really a comprehensive um, source of information that everyone would benefit from. So uh, that'll be my one plug for the day. <clears throat> um, so that's, that's my short answer to the uh, optimum timing. Um, I'm going to go back to the next question now. <clears throat> All right, and this question is, uh, too young or too old for strabismus surgery? When is the right time? Can patients be too old for it? And that question is from a physician in Nigeria. Um, second part of this, I think, which is related, is from a physician in South Africa again. At what age should congenital non-accommodative squint, so congenital esotropia or infantile esotropia, be corrected? Um, too young or too old for strabismus surgery? I, you know, I don't think there's really an, again, there's not really an answer for that. I operate on uh, kids with strabismus. Um, that might be as young as six months for congenital esotropia. Um, but really the answer is whenever, if you have stable measurements and you have a healthy patient, um, you do the surgery as, as soon as you safely can with anesthesia. And, and so we're talking about infantile strabismus right here. So my target with a <clears throat> congenital esotropia is somewhere between six months and two years. Um, there is some evidence that after two years, results aren't quite as impressive, um, but it's hard to find a lot of support for doing ultra early surgery under six months and certainly you start to get into anesthesia concerns there. Um, but even between six months and a year, you have anesthesia concerns. So I think you do it whenever it's reproducible and it's safe. <clears throat> um, and there really is no upper limit. I do a lot of adult strabismus business surgery as I get older, and uh, I operate on people that might be in their 90s. So it really depends on, if, is it bothering the patient? Is it bothering the patient, and are they healthy enough to undergo it? This is a pretty, pretty benign surgery. So, um, uh, you know, if they're having problems and, and they want it fixed, fine. If they have 30 XT and they don't care, there's no sense in doing the surgery, right? So, um, Again, there's no convincing evidence that this ultra early surgery um, is a benefit. So I think it, you know, with all these things, um, again, everything that I tell you, some of it I will show you research studies to, to support it. But other times I'm just giving you my, my anecdotal experience um, having done this for 20 years now. And the, people may disagree with what I say, there's no right or wrong answer with any of this. And I think that's another thing everyone needs to keep in mind. There's more than one way to do this stuff. And as long as you do it well and do it reproducible and do it safe, that's all you got to do.
right? <clears throat> Uh, and then it gets down to techniques and opinions. Like, take it all in and choose what's going to be right for your situation. All right, so let's go to our next question. All right. Uh, this is about congenital glaucoma. And this comes from a physician in India. What is the change in corneal diameter and axial length in post trabeculotomy congenital glaucoma patients. All right. So, when we talk about um, congenital glaucoma, uh, we have a process in, where pressure builds up in the eye and, and we get buphthalmus, right? The eyes get larger. Well, buphthalmus t tends to occur up until about age three, four, maybe five sometimes. But usually if a, if a child that's five years old has elevated intraocular pressure, unless it's really high, they're not usually getting axial length changes anymore at that point, all right? So the younger they are, the easier the eye gets larger and wider and buphthalmic. As you get to be four and five, that kind of goes away. So the same is true in terms of reversal with, uh, with these surgeries. If you get the surgery done, get the pressure down, um, you will see dramatic changes in optic nerve cupping, right? So you may have a 0.8 cup and all of a sudden it shrinks down to, to just like 0.3 or less. Uh, and you see that routinely in infants when you're able to see through the cornea before the surgery and after, all right? And um, now axial length changes and corneal diameter changes, they reverse less. There's no question about that but you can see the corneal diameter go down by a half a millimeter when you get the pressure down. You might see the axial length go down by a half or one millimeter, but you don't see these dramatic changes like you do in the optic nerve, okay? So uh, <clears throat> again, the, uh, the answer to that is that it's um, somewhere around age three to five, and you're gonna see less of a change in the axial length and corneal diameter. Uh, but you're going to see more change in the optic nerve head as that regression occurs. Okay. Uh, another cataract question. This one, uh, this is an important one because this comes down to the topic of intraocular lenses. What about unilateral cataract in a five month old when the parents are unable to use a contact lens? Um, and that's from Egypt. Second question, is intraocular lens contraindicated in pediatric patients? And that's from India. Now, this question comes up uh, when I started in practice 20 years ago. Um, we were just starting to put intraocular lenses into infants. And I've put, <clears throat> I've put lenses into infants uh, that were premature and it was on their due date. And they did really well. And I've put uh, their vision might be, have ended up 20, 40, 20, 50. Um, now, 18 years later, because I'm still seeing these kids. But you see other kids who get an intraocular lens as an infant, and it's a disaster, and you, and you got to take it out. Uh, they get membranes. So there's a lot of variability here. And again, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, I do think we saw a little bit of a backlash on intraocular lenses after the infant aphakia treatment study. And so we're going to talk just a second about the infant aphakia treatment study. So that everyone understands what the implications of this study were, All right? So before the study went on, people were putting intraocular lenses in, some were really committed to it. After the study, it seemed like most of the US surgeons started to back off on unilateral intraocular lenses. And I think that's a key word right there, unilateral. So let's go to a little summary here of the uh, infant aphakia treatment study. And then, then we're going to talk about its implications, okay? All right. So the infant aphakia treatment study um, randomized 114 infants. And these were infants. They were between four weeks and seven months, all right? So this study, right off the bat, does not apply to a one-year-old or a two-year-old or a four-year-old or a six-year-old. This study applied to infants. This age group is completely different than infants who are one year older than this. Other take home lesson here, these were unilateral cataracts. 
These were not bilateral cataracts. Again, that's a different animal and your criteria are different for that. All right, they were randomized to intraocular lens or a fake at contact lens. One key point about this, the ones that were randomized to the aphakic contact lens, the study gave them the contact lenses, all right? These people lose these all the time. So if, if you're in a situation where someone is gonna lose an aphakic contact lens and can't afford to replace it, right off the bat, that's not a good solution for them, right? Right off the bat, they might be way better off with an intraocular lens because they're never gonna be able to replace uh, that, that contact lens. And, and here in the United States, those contact lenses are at least 100 US. All right, the study followed them until age five. So they were old enough that they got visual acuity outcomes on, on most of them. It wasn't just uh, grading acuities, and et cetera. All right, what did that study show? At age four and a half or five, there was absolutely no difference in the visual acuity outcomes. Zero difference. They were not statistically different. So the visual acuity results between a contact lens in an intraocular lens were the same. About half the patients in each group had a visual acuity better than 20 over 200. Now, honestly, the big factor that decides what the visual acuity is, is how early the surgery is done and how well the parents comply with the patching. It probably has a lot less to do with whether it's a contact lens or an intraocular lens. And you can see that that was borne out here. The, the method of aphakic correction didn't really seem to matter. All right, but what was the take on here? The intraocular lens group had more complications and required more surgeries, and many of these were in the very first post-operative year. So that's the finding that caused a little bit of a, a backslide on people being aggressive with intraocular lenses, unilateral intraocular lenses in infants in the United States. We still do it in some cases, but we're more likely to leave them aphakic and use a contact lens temporarily until they can get a sulcus lens or lens with optic capture in the bag later. Uh, the other argument sometimes for uh, intraocular lenses is that it protects against glaucoma. Well, that doesn't seem to be true. In both groups, a third of the eyes developed glaucoma or were glaucoma suspects. Uh, I think that that uh, concept of intraocular lenses protecting against glaucoma came from a time when they were only being put into uh, normal size eyes or larger eyes. And if you had a smaller eye, you didn't get a contact lens. So you have a PHPB, you have microphthalmia. Well, those are the ones that are more likely to get glaucoma. So it has, I think the chance of developing glaucoma has less to do with whether there's an intraocular lens and more to do with uh, the underlying size and developmental status of that eye. All right, so, um, um, so let's talk about this just a little bit more. Uh, all right, so, that's, that's what the infant aphakia treatment study showed. Now, what do I think the role is for uh, intraocular lens in infants? Um, if, again, if, if they can't get or maintain or handle a contact lens, that kid's gonna be way better off with an intraocular lens, regardless of what age they are, than they would be a contact lens, okay? Um, if follow-up is an issue, sometimes that is an argument for um, intraocular lenses. However, we have to keep in mind that if that child is less than five to eight years of age, you probably always want to be doing a, a primary posterior capsulotomy. If you just take the lens out and put an intraocular lens in in a, in a three-year-old, and then six months later they have a posterior capsule opacification, you might as well have not even done the cataract surgery, right? So you, you need to be versed in the technique of opening the posterior capsule with one of the various techniques. And again, uh, those techniques are discussed in the pediatric cataract surgery module and, um, and in the, the pediatric cataract lecture that we, uh, I have given a few times, which is cataloged on CyberSight. So take a look at those because that's critical to open the posterior capsule in a child less than uh, five to eight years of age. All right. Um, bilateral cases, you know, one year old with uh, bilateral cataracts and you're doing cataract surgery. Uh, for me, that's kind of where I'm sometimes uncertain. Should I do bilateral intraocular lenses or just do aphakic glasses? Uh, because, you know, glasses are relatively expensive, they're relatively available, and bilateral cataracts of any age 
always do well with aphakic glasses. So a lot of times in these bilateral cases, I'll do that as a temporary measure um, in infants or in one-year-olds and, um, and, uh, and then do the secondary IOLs later. In a two-year-old, uh, now you start to get into an area where I'm quite comfortable going ahead and doing a lens implant bilaterally in a two-year-old. So two and on up, I, I think intraocular lenses are definitely the way to go. Under two and under one, you kind of got to take the big picture into consideration and do what's right for that particular patient. Okay. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. And we actually have some more intraocular lens questions coming up in just a bit, but let's go back to some of our, our next question here. <laughs> uh, strabismus and amblyopia question. This comes from uh, one of my new friends in Syria. Uh, is amblyopia common in infantile esotropia? Okay. Generally, it is less common. Um, it definitely occurs less than 50% of the time when you have congenital esotropia, but it does occur. Um, maybe it's around 30% or less in my clinical experience. Do you treat it before strabismus surgery? Well, the answer to that is yes, um, and we'll talk about that. Is patching two hours daily recommended for the best result? All right. Um, all right, so um, infantile esotropia, yes, they do get amblyopia. Um, and you, how do you detect that in a, in a six-month-old or a one-year-old? Well, mostly we're looking at fixation preference, right? You can't test their vision. Most of us don't have teller cards and all these fancy research tools. We're looking at their fixation preference. And if they'll alternate freely, great. You don't need to do any patching. If, if they're alternating, I don't do alternate patching. I just monitor them. I repeat their surgical measurements until it's stable. And once they come back two or three visits in a row with, uh, with 35, X, or 35 ET, time to go. Uh, they go to surgery. So I'd like to see a couple visits in a row with the same measurement. Now, if you're not going to have follow-up on these, um, then you, know, you take one measurement and you do the surgery. It is hard to do alternate cover on these infants, but it's not impossible. Um, I like to use a loose prism rather than a prism bar on infants. If you cannot do all, and, and honestly, you're not going to be able to get distance fixation to get distance measurements usually. So I'm usually holding a toy. I've got my little Tigger toy right over here somewhere. Let me see if I can grab him. Um, anyone who's worked with me has seen Tigger. We've got about a hundred of them. And usually you can get kids to look at that. I like Tigger. He's got a tail. That tail is very important. It goes right there. Okay. Now the kid's looking at you, looking at the toy. You got a few seconds to get this done. You get the toy in your mouth. You hold your prism up. You do your cover testing. You're done. All right. Just confirm that it's about 30, 35. This stuff is kind of ballpark at this age. Um, Gene Helveston, my mentor, basically said these come in small, medium, and large. And I think he's right. You know, you're not measuring down to 0.25 millimeters when you're doing a recession for congenital esotropia. Uh, you're ballparking this stuff to try and get them straight so they can have good sensory status. All right, so a quick cover test at near, <clears throat> get your measurements, and once they're stable, you go to surgery and you get them fixed up. Um, second part of the question had to do with um, do you treat the amblyopia before you do surgery? Yes. If they have a fixation preference, I will start patching. And I'll patch with the goal of trying to get them alternating. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes they have pretty strong fixation preferences. Um, but if they won't alternate, I like to at least see that they'll hold the non-preferred eye for a second or two before they switch back. Um, so you're trying to get some semblance of getting them to use the non-preferred eye. Why do we do this before surgery? Why not do it after surgery, right? Just get the surgery done and now we'll work on some amblyopia. Well, the reason is, A, we know there's not a huge hurry between six months and two years. Uh, it's kind of soft on sensory outcomes. You want to get them lined up as soon as you can, but it's not like it's night and day between doing it at six months and doing it at a year or two. So you have a little time here. 
once you straighten their eyes, it is really hard in a one-year-old to tell which eye they're fixating with. Yes, you can do base down prism tests um, and other prism tests, but yeah, it can be tough to tell if, if they're straight. I mean, if they still have strabismus, yeah, you can usually tell which eye they're fixating with, but, uh, but even then it's a bit of a chore. If they have 40 ET, it's pretty easy to tell which eye they're using. So um, it's easier to manage the strabism, uh, the, excuse me, it's easier to manage the amblyopia management um, in advance when you can see which eye they're fixating with. All right, so I like to do a little bit of that first. And then, of course, you have to continue afterward uh, and just do the best you can until you can tell what their acuities are. All right. And then the third part of that question uh, from Syria was, is, do you patch two hours a day? How many hours a day do you know to patch um, for amblyopia? Um, you know, we've all kind of come into this two hours a day uh, mindset. And I see that here in my practice, and I think I do it too. I'm like, oh, I'm just patching everyone two hours a day. Uh, infant or the amblyopia treatment study in 2003 said it was equal to six hours a day. And I think we have to kind of keep in mind a few factors here um, and not just automatically do that. We need to take it one step for, uh, further and think about the other factors. <clears throat> and so we actually are going to talk about the amblyopia treatment study where the two hours a day came down from. Um, but let me uh, go back to my next slide here. And this next slide um, has a little bit more information uh, about what we just talked about. And the thing to keep in mind here is that younger children, this third, third bullet point and then the two small bullet points, younger children are more sensitive to patching, right? Their neurologic system is immature. They're way more um, responsive to patching than a five-year-old, right? We see that every day. So, you may only have to patch one hour a day in a three month old. Um, in the infant aphakia treatment study, um, the amblyopia treatment guidelines were patching one hour a day per month of age. So if you had a four month old, they wouldn't be patched any more than four hours a day. And if you had a six month old, they wouldn't be patched any more than six hours a day. And I think it kind of maxed out at half of all waking hours. All right, so we're not, we're not generally patching all day long. We're not generally patching even eight hours a day, um, but it's somewhere in that one to six hours, depending on the age and how dense you think the amblyopia is. Again, you have to kind of use, use a little judgment here. All right. Um, the patching the patching where this two hours a day came from is uh, one of the amblyopia treatment studies. And, and I've participated in many of these and I, I did participate in this one. And these are from PEDIG, the Pediatric Eye Disease Investigator Group. And I consider this group's studies to be of the highest quality. They are, ex this and the infant aphakia treatment study are gold standards for how randomized studies should be done, multi-center basis, monitored, both private practice and academic practice, large sample sizes. <coughs> I trust the results of these studies implicitly. All right. This study, uh, I forget which one this was, I don't know if it was ATS3 or whatever, but this was the one that said um, part-time patching two hours daily was as rapid and effective as part-time patching six hours daily. All right. Few caveats here. This was for moderate amblyopia. This was for children uh, with 2040 to 2080 vision. This does not apply to dense amblyopia. Um, now we had a couple hundred patients, uh, more than 200 patients in the study, and there was a mixture of strabismic and an isometropic amblyopia. So a good mix of both common kinds. Ages, so again, ages, uh, these children had to be able to do acuity chart testing. So they were all, and they had to be younger than uh, seven years of age and younger. So from a practical standpoint, there weren't any six month olds and there weren't any one year olds. And I don't think there were any two year olds in the study because none of them could do acuity testing. 
Um, but I think there were some three-year-olds. But most of these patients were probably four, five, six, seven. All right. Um, and again, so after this came out, I have to admit most of my patching now is about two hours daily. But that does not apply to infants. It does not apply to dense amblyopia. And it does not apply to older children with an eye or adults. Uh, the next question that I have, again, another amblyopia question, uh, or actually this is a strabismus surgery question. We'll shake it up a little bit here. And this is a good one. <clears throat> this is a common question. Um, the first one is from Romania, uh, strabismus surgery keys. And there wasn't much more explanation to that. And I think that um, when we talk about strabismus surgery, there's the technique. And we don't have time to go through the technique. That's a whole lecture on itself. But then there are the surgical guidelines, the surgical dose response, right? That's the question I get from fellows and residents. Everyone wants to know, well, how much surgery should I do? And the second question from Egypt says just that. How do you determine the correct amount of muscle recession after strabismus assessment, after strabismus measurements? All right, what do I do? Uh, you know, the books have multiple sources of tables, and, and there are... Um, all the textbooks in the back usually have these charts, and I'm aware of at least three or four different charts, and they're all roughly similar. What do I use? I use um, th these measure these this guideline. These guidelines are probably 50 years old now, right? These are from Marshall Parks and modified by one of his fellows and one of my mentors um, during my residency, uh, Dr. David Steger. Um, and these are. Good. I use these pretty exclusively, except in the larger angles of deviation. I, uh, I draw from some other tables to get some of the larger deviations, especially on, uh, uh, well, let me tell you first how you use these. Um, so let's just start over here. Exotropia, you're going to recess both laterals. So for me, 20 prism diopters is a five millimeter recession. 30 is a seven millimeter recession. And then as you get above that, that's where I kind of go on to some other tables. Oops, let me go back. Um, so you do that same thing to both sides. Um, conversely, if you need to do bilateral resections for residual exotropia, um, which I don't do this too often, but these are the same guys you're gonna resect um, about four or five, six millimeters, depending on the numbers. If you're doing a recess resect, you're going to pick one uh, from each of these two columns. So if I'm doing a unilateral recess resect, I'm going to pick a lateral rectus recession and pair it with um, the same category of medial rectus resection. So 20 XT, I'm going to recess the lateral five millimeters, and then I'm going to resect the medial four millimeters. Then same thing with esotropia. Here we go. Uh, we have um, same thing. Mostly we're doing medial rectus recessions. I pretty much use these exact numbers and you can see these go up pretty large. I don't do seven millimeter recessions. Um, I will occasionally do 6.5. You have to be careful as you get in these larger numbers, you get some um, late slippages and over corrections. <clears throat> um, so um, you can see what these numbers are here. Um, there, you always have to take into consideration some other things though. Those numbers to me are for a primary surgery. You're doing the very first surgery. Um, if you, if someone's already had a medial rectus recession and now I'm going to do a lateral rectus resection, I don't do a full surgical dose. I'll usually back off a little bit on the resection uh, because you're working against weakened medials now. So those are the kind of some of the things you need to take into consideration. Um, one of the things that I've gotten into recently, and we'll, I might go to the whiteboard here for a second and talk about this, is I've become a big fan of, instead of doing resections and taking a piece of the muscle out, I've become a big fan of doing plications. And um, we haven't talked about this too much on, on, uh, any, of, on any of our um, uh, lectures in the past. So let's just, let me switch to my whiteboard here for a minute. Uh, and I'm hopefully going to have a video of this soon. I've been, <laughs> been saying that for about a year. Um, 
but David Plager, uh, who's one of my senior partners, kind of got me started on these um, a, a couple years ago. Um, I'm not sure who turned him on to it, but it's, it's become a big part of our practice. And let's see if I can get my whiteboard up here. No, of course it's, okay, it's connecting here. Let's just see it. Okay, we got it. All right, so you should be able to see my whiteboard now. Uh, Lawrence messaged me if you don't see that, but looks like it's up. Yeah, we got oh, it. You got it? Okay. So let's just talk about a recession. If you're doing a recession, there's our cornea, and then we got our muscle. Uh, we're gonna talk about resections, sorry, all right? All right, so normal resection, we're gonna resect six millimeters. We're going to um, uh, put our vicral suture here, and then we're going to basically cut this out and pull everything forward, right? Well, what I don't like about that is that you're cutting right in front of your suture, and um, of course, this can sometimes be um, under a lot of strain because you're tightening this up. So sometimes you can get this suture kind of slipping forward towards the cut end right here. Um, so there's some opportunity for things like slipped muscles, lost muscles, and there's also opportunity for bleeding. Um, what I've gone to here recently is a plication or a tuck. Uh, so we're talking about you got your muscle, and you're still gonna put your suture back here. But now, instead of cutting this section out, what we're going to do is just, we're gonna bypass, we're gonna bypass this. What do I mean by that? It means we're gonna take our suture, our double arm six up micro suture, and we're gonna pass those needles through the sclera right here. And then we're gonna, Pass this one through the sclera right here. So um, what happens then, once you've passed your needles through there and you start to pull this forward and make your iPad do something crazy, what happens is now this fold gets formed. So the muscle, I'm gonna exaggerate a fold here. Right. So this is the section in front of the suture. And our suture is here and here and there, comes around and there, right? So we've got this fold right here that we've created. And you need to make sure that this space right here is tight, that that muscle is completely uh, folded up against it. And I think that's the critical step here. <clears throat> Um, you want that, you're taking that, that muscle and you're folding it, all right? And you want, as that muscle folds, you want that, those two halves of the muscle way up against each other and you want that vicral super tight right there. Now what happens is, um, it looks bad at first, you got this big lump of tissue from this fold, but it disappears. It absolutely disappears. After about um, two to four to six weeks, it's flat. All right, so it takes, maybe it takes a little bit longer to heal or it's a little more lumpy bumpy. I wouldn't say it takes longer to heal because resections are always more inflamed, but it looks lumpy bumpy for a bit. But you never are cutting the muscle. You're never at risk of losing that muscle unless you just lacerate it with, uh, with the needle. And I use the same surgical dose response tables. I don't change my numbers at all. And I think the results have been fantastic. And again, uh, we've been doing that for at least a couple years and, uh, and most of my partners have switched over to that. Not a new technique, but it, just a resurgence of something that's been around for a long time. And I love it. And as a teacher and a busy strabismus surgeon, I do it all the time. And I, I, I advocate that you try that sometime. Um, again, you have to keep those folds up tight. It takes a good assistant because you, they need to lift up. You, you need a skinny hook underneath there because you need to be able to slide the hook out once you tie that loop. All right, so we use um, some Helveston hooks, which have small, small to no knobs on the end. So a non-knobbed or a very skinny hook that you can slide out after you tie. Um, your assistant also has to hold that fold up at, right, at the right tension and move it around back and forth because they need to not undo the knot you're tightening. 
and they also need to lay the fold where you can get your knots down on top, okay? So, all right, so uh, let's go back to our next question. Uh, let me make sure I covered all the answers to that one. And keep going here. I want to get to as many of these questions as we can. <clears throat> All right. So strabismus measurements. Um, again, um, this, these, these numbers. If you go to that pediatric ophthalmology module that I talked about in the uh, strabismus section, you'll find these numbers. Okay. So cybersite library courses, pediatric uh, fundamentals of pediatric ophthalmology, um, full course series. Uh, go to the basic and advanced strabismus modules there. You'll find those. And those are great modules. Again, surgery videos, um, interactive, the whole works. All right, next question. Uh, which strabismus cases are at risk for diplopia after surgery? And that comes from the country of Burundi. Uh, and this one's related, I think. If a patient with intermittent XT complains of diplopia with neutralizing prism, are they at risk of post-op diplopia? Uh, this is a common concern. Um, I get this question a lot either through the CyberSite consults, um, which, which I think are one of the most valuable things at your disposal, by the way, CyberSite consults, um, pairing you up with a mentor who can um, analyze your case and give you feedback from a, a world expert. That's, and it's free. Um, that we all should take more advantage of that and do more cyber site consults, okay? Um, <clears throat> be sure when you do strabismus consults to give some indication of what the motility is like and um, the measurements, at least, at least measurements in the primary position. Um, if you have photos, that's nice. And sometimes you can just do the whole case with photos, um, but it's nice to have at least some of your interpretation of the motility and the measurement as well as a few gaze position photos. All right. Um, all right. So the um, diplopia, I honestly don't worry a whole lot about diplopia and that sounds a bit cavalier, but you know, I've been doing this 20 years and I can think of two people who had intractable diplopia after their surgery neither one of them one of their surgery reversed they 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 both said that uh, they were so happy that their eyes were straight that they, the second image didn't really bother them okay i've seen maybe i take that back i think i've seen one unhappy patient with intractable diplopia uh, who would been like a congenital et and got moved out of her area of suppression and was just generally unhappy <clears throat> but i think she was going to be unhappy kind of no matter what happened so um yeah, it doesn't seem to be a big deal. He's certainly in kids, it's not a big deal. Kids, uh, the younger they are, they just suppress. I mean, yeah, they, they, they get amblyopia instead of diplopia, so you got to deal with that. Um, teenagers, they and young adults, uh, can, uh, if, they, if they've had strabismus for a long time, they're pretty good at suppressing secondary images unless you just really bump people out of their suppression scotoma. But what usually happens is they have diplopia for a bit and it goes away or it doesn't bother them anymore. People that are bothered by diplopia are people that had normal eyes as, uh, as children, right? They had normal eyes and then something happens and they, they get strabismus and they have diplopia, right? They get diplopia. Now you operate on them and it's not, it's not perfect and they still have diplopia. Those are the ones that are a headache for me. I mean, they, you know, they still have diplopia. We need to do more surgery. We need to do prisms. But someone who's walking around a 40 XT um, or 30 ET, I don't know. I just don't see it that much. I, I, I like to do a subjective prism test, which is one of the questions there. You know, you hold the correcting. Someone's got a 30 intermittent XT, and you hold prism in front of them. Well, for intermittent deviations, I don't. I don't buy a lot of that because they're intermittent and um, it sometimes it takes them a long time to, to kind of adapt. Um, so the intermittent deviations, I don't usually go by that. The constant deviations, I'll try to get some idea of what they can tolerate in a prism. So if they have 30 ET, I'll, 
I'll hold the prism. I'll let them. I like to do this. I like to take the prism bar and let the patient hold it and slide it up and down and see what they like, whether it's uh, hypertropia or esotropia or exotropia. I like to subjectively let them play with that prism and see what they like. And I write that number down. And then I, I see what they become diplopic with on my exam separately. And I record both those numbers. That doesn't mean that's the number I'm going to target. But if they have 50 ET and they're diplopic, if I give them more than 30 prism, I'm probably going to back off just a little bit and kind of try and maybe leave them a little undercorrected. So not everyone may agree with that, but I've done 10,000 strabismus surgeries and diplopia after surgery. If they didn't have diplopia before surgery, diplopia after surgery is not a big deal. If they do have diplopia because they had a bad result, you just fix it. You fix it with prism or you fix it with a reoperation. Um, reoperations happen. You know, this is just part of what we do as trabismus surgeon. I think that's something to keep in mind. Everyone's not going to turn out perfect. And it doesn't matter if you do adjustable sutures or if you do fixed sutures. And I've done both, and I'm a fixed suture person, um, but some people are the exact opposite. Um, when I counsel patients about strabismus surgery, I tell them, look, you got about an 80% chance that what we do today, you're going to be happy with and you never have surgery again. And you got about a 20% chance that you're going to need a reoperation. You're going to need a touch up at some point. Either what we do, we're not going to be happy with it in six to eight weeks, or it's going to change as you get older. I think as long as people have those expectations, uh, post-operative diplopia is, it's, it's not a big deal. So, uh, you do take it into consideration, <clears throat> um, but I don't let that prevent me from operating on people, and they are happy, and they do fine. All right, so let's keep going uh, with some more questions. And uh, uh, we're getting down about 10 minutes left, so we'll... I'm undoubtedly going to have some left over. So if you don't, I don't get to your question, uh, A, I apologize, and B, uh, we'll just do it the next time. I'll, I'll start from where we left off, and we'll just keep adding to this list. I kind of like this format, um, and uh, I'm happy to do it as much as we want if you give us good feedback. So if you like this format while we're still here, if you like this format, let us know. If you don't like this format, also let us know. We'll, we'll deal with that too. Uh, okay, question from Austria. Surgery for Brown syndrome. I think it's a good one because this comes up a lot um, when I do cybersite consults. One of the most common, this and Duane syndrome and maybe DVD are some of the most common questions that I get. So I think we should talk about this. One thing, a couple things to keep in mind about Brown syndrome. One, most of these people are actually okay. Um, you know, most of these people are okay. Um, they, they have head postures. Um, I'll come back to this slide, but um, most of these people are okay. They have head postures and, you know, they'll be like this and turning. But, um, but they generally don't have a lot of diplopia. Unless, unless in the primary position, they're just flat out off. They've got a manifest uh, hypertropia. But most of the times they don't. Most of the times they're pretty decent-ish in primary, or they have a little head posture to neutralize it. So when they go to the side, you see this big deviation. Certainly when they go up and to the side of the browns, then they're out of whack. But, uh, you know, that's not terribly bothersome for most people. With One thing to keep in mind, with kids, kids are short. They're looking up at their parents all the time. Well, that's where brown syndrome looks terrible. So you take that, but you don't necessarily make decisions based on what the parent's telling you. I like to see, well, what are they doing as they get a little bit older, school age? What's their head posture doing? Um, or are they getting amblyopia from the Brown syndrome? Less common, but it can happen. Um, so let's, let's revisit a couple facts here um, from studies about Brown syndrome that um, can help us make this decision. One thing uh, to keep in mind is that 85% of these improve spontaneously to some degree. Now it doesn't mean by age five to seven years, that doesn't mean that it goes away 100%, but it does mean that they get better. 
okay? So go slow on deciding about surgery unless it's really severe. You know, if they have amblyopia or a horrible head posture or diplopia that they can describe to you, okay, they need surgery. But otherwise, give it a little bit of time, see how it shakes out as they get closer to school age. All right. One of the frequent treatments for Brown syndrome is a tenotomy, um, an unguarded tenotomy. That means we're just going to cut across the superior oblique. A uh, couple points to keep in mind here. The closer you cut the superior oblique to the trochlea, the more effect you're going to get. So if you just disinsert it from the sclera temporally, you're going to get a little bit of effect. If you cut it nasal, just nasal to the superior rectus, you're going to get more effect. And if you cut it next to the trochlea, you're going to get a huge effect. Um, I usually go um, just along the nasal border of the superior rectus. But um, if you look at these unguarded tenotomies, so let's just cut the, cut the tendon, let it go. Um, 50 to 85% of those are reported to lead to secondary surgeries for overcorrections as time goes on. That's a pretty high overcorrection rate. So um, Ken Wright certainly popularized the concept of a silicone band spacer. Um, others have uh, used suture spacers, and these are what we call guarded tenotomies. Um, so um, I'll draw a little photo, a little picture on that in just a minute. Um, but before I get to those, uh, so my usual approach is to do monitor the vision, monitor the alignment and head posture, wait to close to school age if possible, manage the amblyopia if needed. And if they need surgery, I usually try one of these guarded tenotomies with the silicone spacer, um, uh, so usually a 40 or 240 retinal band. Um, and if that does not work, and a lot of times that does not work, they're still pretty locked in, then I'll do a free tenotomy in the same location. I'll just go back and take the spacer out. Um, but spacers are an interesting thing and people always have questions about that. So let's, all right, we'll talk about, <laughs> if you go to the strabismus modules, um, again, on the uh, CyberSite Learn, uh, the, the, the fundamentals of ophthalmology, pediatric ophthalmology, uh, it shows you exactly how to do a spacer. Um, let's cover a couple more questions before we wrap this up on the top of the hour here. We're going pretty long here. Um, matter of fact, I'm going to make this our last question. In pediatric glaucoma, which drops are effective and safe in the zero to three month age group? Okay, so uh, this is when we, this is from Nigeria. Um, all right, so congenital glaucoma, we're usually getting these kids when they're a few months old, hopefully, um, zero to three months is a great time to get a hold of them. <clears throat> and which drops are okay to use? Um, it looks like our connection's a little unstable, so hopefully you can still hear me. Uh, I'm going to put up the, um, just in case it's choppy, let's put this up. So glaucoma drops in infants. So what do I do? Well, I try to operate them on uh, as early as I can. So as soon as I see them, I'm trying to take them to surgery with that same week or the next week. Uh, as a temporizing measure, I will try and use 0.5% Timolol. So beta blockers usually come in 1%. Um, if I can either get the Betoptic Timolol 0.5%, I will use that. You can also have pharmacies um, dilute that and make it for you. If you do use 1% regular, uh, Tim Optic. Um, again, even with the half percent, I think it's a good idea to have the parents do punctual occlusion, put the drop in, wipe away the excess, um, occlude the punctum for several minutes um, so you don't get a lot of systemic absorption. But I've never had any problems using a beta blocker in an infant. Uh, dorzolamide, carbonic anhydrase inhibitor drops also seem to be fine. You know, they burn, eyes get red, but um, they work okay. Uh, prostaglandin analogs, so Zalatan, um, et cetera. I'm not real pressed with these in kids. I use them sometimes, older kids, but they don't seem to really do much in young kids. Uh, the one thing that I, reason I thought this was a good question in particular is because alphagan, which is bromonidine. Bromonidine, um, you should pretty much never use, and uh, certainly not in infants, but even in kids under five years of age, or if you have a kid who's kind of on the smaller size, they get really profound CNS depression to the point where they're almost like comatose. You can't wake them up, 
and it lasts for several hours. So that is definitely a no-no. Stay away from bromonidine. All right. Um, so, all right, let me go back. And I'm just realizing now that I probably didn't have that shared, but uh, here we go. Um, so it's, we're at the top of the hour. There are a lot of questions and I've got 14 new ones that have come in during this, uh, during this webinar. So next time we do this, I will start off where I left off in the question queue for those of you that submitted them this past month. Um, and then I will go through and I'll start at the end of that. I'll add on the questions that came in today. Uh, I appreciate everyone being with us for the hour. Um, this is recorded. It will be on the CyberSite library. And again, one last time, go ahead and look at the library. A lot of things have changed in the, in the last year or two. That whole fundamentals of pediatric ophthalmology, six module series is there. There's a, a similar interactive uh, series of videos and pop-ups and reference material on manual small incision cataract surgery. Um, we've just done one on ophthalmic nursing, so share that with your OR staff. Um, that's a great one. And um, currently we're, we're working on a FACO module, which we should have out before the end of this year, and getting ready to start on a glaucoma, fundamentals of glaucoma series. And we're just going to keep working through all the subspecialties till we have all these, but these are great multimedia blended learning modules that you can do in small packets and are really the core of what you need to know to take care of these. It's not exhaustive, but this is, this is kind of stuff that if you were doing a fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology, this is what you'd be taught. If you were doing a fellowship in um, uh, glaucoma, that's what's gonna be in that module, okay? So um, check frequently on those and see what's new. And until the next webinar, I'll say goodbye and I'll, I'll see you then.